Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, just ask. Okay. So it's ready, right? Uh, okay, great. So it's our great pleasure to uh, have uh, Professor Rao from the University of uh, California at San Diego here to give us a talk on patient methods for fast you know, recovery. And this is in a uh, joint uh, uh, seminar, uh, both for uh, EC Department of uh, NC State and also uh, for H4E uh, ENCS uh, section uh, processing chapter. Uh, this is also served as a uh, technical meeting for uh, processing chapter. So uh, here's a brief uh, introduction for Professor Raw. Uh, he received uh, his special degree uh, in electrical engineering from IIT Kalapa and master and PhD from USC uh, in 1980s. And since 1983, he has been with the University of San, uh, California at San Diego, so it's like more than 30 years of service. So uh, he's currently a professor there, and uh, he's the holder of the uh, Epson in our chair in Wireless Access Networks and the director of the Center for Wireless Communications between 2008 and 2011. Uh, his research interests are in the areas of uh, digital signal processing, uh, estimation theory, and optimization theory with applications to digital computations, speech signal processing, and biomedical signal processing. He's a fellow of IGOE. Uh, he, uh, he and his students has won several best paper awards, including uh, 2013 Best Paper Award uh, for HOE VTC for Shaper Mars Cell Random Informing with CDF based scheduling, and also uh, the uh, 2008 Stephen Rice Prize uh, Paper Award for his paper uh, published on HOE transactions on communications, the topics on network reality for Matthews and MIMO informing networks and applications. So he has been a member for uh, many technical committees of IEEE and uh, currently is a member of the Machine Learning for Signal Processing Technical Committee. He has also served on numerous projects uh, for um, IEEE and uh, University. So with this uh, brief introduction, let's uh, uh, welcome uh, Professor Rao to give us uh, his lecture. Thank you for the invitation, and of course, thank you for the introduction. Okay. It's good to see a good attendance here. I notice a lot of uh, young people, so I'm assuming a lot of graduate students are here. Okay. So, uh, my, my discussion will be the talk. You know, whenever you prepare a talk like this, you're not sure what the audience is. So I will try to set up the problem, make sure if you're a beginner that there is something for you, okay. and then towards the end, go towards slightly more advanced topics. Okay. Uh, of course, uh, first, before I start, I want to thank my students you know, who, who make this all possible. Okay, they are the people who do the work. So these are all, some of them have already graduated and then still with me. Okay. And my focus, as the title indicates, will be on Bayesian methods. So uh, let me start with some motivation. Okay. And uh, this really is, uh, when I was preparing this talk, I said, what is my motivation? And so this is really my motivation. Okay. And hopefully, it will, some of it will resonate with you. Right? I think if you've been looking at the uh, papers that have come out in the conferences and so on, you may recognize that there are many, many applications now for this kind of work. Okay? So, and I think this will continue to grow, okay? uh, particularly as more people become aware of these ideas. Okay? So I think this, uh, as an academic, you know, we always say, what are the new things we should teach our students? So I do believe this will be something that will be a valuable tool for practicing signature processing students. And we, in fact, last, uh, last year I taught for the first time a class on compressed sensing. So I have a feeling some of the material will probably become uh, standard in a few years. Okay. More importantly, I think the theory in the last 10 years have seen some real big uh, uh, developments, uh, particularly by the work of Candice and Tao and the work by Donahoe. And as a result, I think there are a lot of interesting guarantees that are now available. And that makes 
I think, uh, for interesting discussion. Uh, my, my work, though, the talk will not be on the, the typical uh, discussion on L1. So I will almost completely avoid the L1 discussion. Okay? So I would like to spend my time on setting up a Bayesian framework for this problem and then hopefully try to convince uh, some of you at least that this is an interesting framework within which you should contemplate solving problems. Okay? So here's the outline of my talk. Uh, I will discuss what the problem is and also mention some extensions. Okay? This will help us set up notation and also make sure if you're not familiar with the problem, you know what the problem is. Okay? Then I do want to spend some time on applications uh, because I think uh, the applications will drive the theory. And so there's a loop here in place. So interesting applications can lead to interesting possible extensions. And also maybe you need to modify the problem. Okay? And in fact, in that context, I will talk about extensions simply because of that. Okay? Even though most of my presentation will be on the very basic problem. Okay? But you may want to think about how you would extend it. And hopefully, you will find the Bayesian framework to be a natural way to extend. And that would be my argument at the end. Okay? And then I will talk about the, the Bayesian techniques. Okay? So I will spend time on the, on the map-based techniques and then more recent hierarchical Bayesian techniques for solving this problem. Okay? So if you are working in the L1, I'm hoping by the end of this uh, talk, you will at least move towards the non-L1 techniques I will talk about in the map framework. Okay? And if you're already working in the non-L1, then I'm hoping you will move towards the hierarchical Bayesian framework. Okay? And then I'll close, uh, provide some summary comments. OK, so what is the problem? Okay. Uh, we're basically trying to solve a linear system of equations. Okay. And y is my measurements. And I have n measurements. And phi is the measurement matrix. And I also refer to it as a dictionary matrix. Okay. And what we want to solve for is x. Okay. Now, of course, linear systems of equations are very common. So one may ask, what is so new about uh, solving this system of equations? Okay. In fact, when the first time I was uh, faced with this problem, I thought it must have been solved. Okay. So this was in 92. Okay. When my graduate student came back from a summer internship with this problem saying, this is what we were doing, and we need to solve this problem. Okay. So we looked around and then realized that you know, maybe one of the few remaining problems still in, in linear systems of equations. Okay. And what makes this interesting is that x, the number of unknowns, is more than the number of equations, first thing. Okay? So you have uh, fewer measurements than unknowns. And what, of course, when you have this system of equations, and if phi is a reasonable matrix, then there'll be, and in the absence of noise, there are at least an infinite number of solutions. Okay? So how do, you dis uh, how do you decide which one you want to pick? Okay? And what makes this unique here is that the number of non-zero entries is assumed to be much smaller than the number of unknowns. So k is the number of non-zero entries, and k is much smaller than okay? In fact, k is usually much smaller than n. Okay? So we will look for solutions where the number of non-zero entries that explain the data are small. Okay? So mathematically, we can state this as follows. Okay? We will count the number of non-zero entries, and we'll say, give us a solution with the minimum smallest number of non-zero entries that explain the, the data. Okay? This is in the noise-free case. So here's my equation that I need to be consistent with, and I need to minimize the number of non-zero entries, and we use the indicator function to count the number of non-zero entries. So the indicator function is 1 when the entry is non-zero, 0 when the entry is, is 0. Okay? So you count the number of non-zero entries. In the uh, case of noise, again, you do this, but you allow for some model mismatch. You say, I'm going to allow for some mismatch in the measurements, but I will still minimize the number of non-zero entries. Okay? So Mathematically, it's a, a problem that you can state quite nicely. I'll come back to the solutions of this problem a little later. Okay. Let's look at a, some extensions that maybe you may want to think about, because you may, not, you may face a problem like this, but not quite this. And one extension is the idea of block sparsity, okay, where things, the zero entries occur in blocks. And I'll say a few words about that. Okay or the idea of having more than one measurement as opposed to a single measurement. Okay? Because in this case, I assume y was a single vector, and now I can imagine a vector of sequence of measurements, and I want to solve this same problem. Okay? And then, of course, you can combine these. Okay? These are not by no means the only extension possible. The reason I mentioned them is this is what motivated me, and also hopefully will give you a, a way to think about how to modify what I discussed today for these more advanced problems. 
So here's the problem of blocks function. Okay. Here we assume that the number of no, the non-zero entry occur in blocks. Okay. So rather than solving for k non-zero entries, you solve for k non-zero blocks. Okay. And there are many variations on this theme. You can have equal blocks, unequal blocks, uh, block boundaries are known, block boundaries are unknown. Okay. So you can probably spend quite considerable amount of time just trying to worry about these variations. Okay. And you may even want to put more structure within a block. Okay? So we, once you say I have a block of non-zero entries, maybe there is additional structure within the block that you may want to enforce. Okay? I mention all these simply because the Bayesian methods have a way in which you can extend probably with less effort. Okay? Not to say that the others cannot be done, but maybe you need uh, smarter students. Okay? So, <laughs> yes. Behind this block assumption? I, I will say, I'll give you when I talk about the applications, I will mention a few. Okay. And here's the, the multiple measurement vector problem where you have actually L measurement vectors as opposed to one. And so what you're solving for is a matrix X. Okay. And here the assumption is that the location of the non zero entries hasn't changed, but their amplitudes have changed. Okay. So what you're solving for is a small number of non zero rows as opposed to number of entries. So you have to put this additional structure. Okay. Now one may, you know, once I start talking about the extension, the whole reason I wanted to mention these is so that it, it spurs some thinking as to what is the right modification for the problem you want to solve. Okay. So here's some applications. Okay. This list, by the way, is very incomplete. Okay. But because if you just simply open up ICAST this year and look at all the papers that mention applications, you can add at least another page of these. Okay. But certainly the work by Malat and, and, and group on matching pursuits for signal representation is a, a, a good uh, application of this. Okay. Our work was motivated by the EEG MEG problem. Okay. And I will say a few words on that. Okay. And that will probably also explain this, uh, why we want, we want to talk about block sparsity and so on. Uh, that was a problem we were faced with. We simplified it to the basic problem. And then we revisit now the more complicated problem. One of the things I noticed, you know, as an academic, this is the, uh, the, the nice thing about being an academic. You have solved some problems in the past. You can go back and revisit old problems and say, can I solve them better with this new tool that I have? Okay. And the problem of least squares, which everybody probably solves, okay, is very familiar with. We know least squares is very, very robust, is an optimal estimate, particularly when you have Gaussian noise. Okay. But it's also known that when you have noise that has outliers in it, then it becomes very sensitive to these outliers. Okay? So if you think about outliers, outliers hopefully mean that a small number of the noises are large, noise components are large. Okay? So there's a sparsity in the large number of non-zero components. Okay? So you can go back and revisit this problem and say, can I use some of these sparsity ideas to actually solve this robust linear regression problem? Okay? And there's some recent work in this which is quite interesting. Speech coding folks have been doing this for a long time. They just didn't quite uh, package it this way. Okay? So if you look at your cell, your cell phone and you look at your speech coder, the, usually there are the self coders and they have a, the excitation usually is a sparse excitation. And a great deal of energy is spent in finding the right sequence that should excite this, this, this system. Okay? So in fact, they, in a lot of the matching pursuit ideas you can actually find in the speech coding literature already. In fact, if you go even further, you'll find it in some of the, the math literature on subset selection. So in that sense, there's a lot of work that has already gone before. It just was done uh, hidden in some application domain. So it was not very easily accessible. Okay? So if you had to read it, you would have to get past a lot of jargon before you figure out what it is that's going on. Okay? Of course, a talk like this would not be complete without mentioning compressed sensing. So I will say a few words about that in case if you're not familiar with it. Okay? Uh, MRI is an application that has uh, been a, a quite uh, uh, promising for CS. Okay. Here the idea is to collect small number of measurements. Okay. And uh, to collect these measurements, I've been told this is quite convenient for when you have children in particular, because they're not willing to sit still for too long. Okay. So you need to collect these measurements, and so you want to do as best as possible with small number of measurements. Okay. So in some cases, you just have no choice but to try to do this with less measurements. Uh, I have a feeling there are folks in communication here, so the idea of, of, of channels being sparse, I will say a few words on that. Okay. Uh, 
And then, of course, there are applications to face recognition, cognitive radio, and so on. In fact, at ICAST this year, there was a demo of, on cognitive radio using these compressed sensing ideas. Okay, so I think the people building prototypes. So I'll say a few more words about applications simply so that you know, uh, there's enough motivation. Okay. And also, the way I think about this is applications really will drive a new theory. Okay. So if you find that this quite doesn't work, you have new things to do. Okay. And you have to ask, what is it? I, how do I modify this? Okay. So here's the, the application of the MEG, uh, EEG social localization problem. This is, you have measurements on the scalp. And then, based on the measurement of the scalp, you're trying to infer activity in the brain. Okay. And so, the number of sensors you can place in the scalp is, by definition, limited. Okay. So, you can n sensors, and you get n measurements. Okay. So, you are limited by the real estate on how many measurements you can get. Okay. But if you ask someone what resolution they want of the image, they would say, give me as fine a resolution as you can give me. Okay. And that's your x. Okay. So if you divide the brain into volume elements, then x will be very large compared to the number of measurements you have. Okay. And these are sensors on the head, so you actually collect a sequence of measurement rather than a single measurement. So you're likely to get not just one vector, but an, a sequence of measurements. Okay. Now, when this problem was posed to us, the, one of the things we were told is when you provide stimulus, depending on the kind of uh, stimulus you provide, maybe the brain, only small portions of the brain will react to that stimulus. So the whole idea is that small areas of the brain will react to that particular stimulus. Okay? So that's where the localization comes in or sparsity comes in. Okay? But in general, if you divide the brain into volume elements and the finer you do them, there will be an area in the brain that is active, not a single point. Okay? So block sparsity becomes very natural. Okay? So this is where block sparsity is, is almost a very useful component. Okay? If you think in terms of time, you know, your reaction has a peak and, an, and, and will decay. So this entry's location does not change, but the strength of the reaction changes. So you can imagine that the location hasn't changed, but you have the variables, the amplitudes have changed. Okay, so this multiple measurement vector that I talked about is very natural. Okay? So this is the problem that we were first faced with. Okay, so we just said strip it down to its bare minimum, and which is what, what I talked about. Okay? And now there are interesting extensions that address this problem. And you can imagine putting in more structure in there if you want into what is the relationship between entries and so on and so forth. Okay. Okay. Uh, here's an example on, on in communications. Okay. And this particularly I've heard discussed in the context of underwater acoustics. Okay. The idea here is we have a channel with a very large delay spread. Okay. That means the first echo and the last echo, there's a big gap. Okay. But the number of echoes or the multipath that you see is small. Okay. So you may only have a few significant bounces, not too many. Okay. So you may have, if you design a digital filter, and you do them at uh, this spacing of T, you may have a very large digital filter okay, whose coefficients you need to estimate. Okay. But most of them are zero. Okay. Yes? So what, what does the negative mean? Oh, this could be if you're just looking at the real part. Okay, and, and it's complex. Okay. So... Uh, what may happen, you don't know where they are. Okay? You don't know the location of these bounces. Okay? So you, don't, you know it's, it has a small number of bounces, but you don't know exactly where they are. So if you try to estimate the entire channel, okay, you could, pretending they're all non-zero, okay? you'll get a lot of noise components adding to your filter. Okay? Whereas if you knew where, which components are non-zero, then you have a much simpler task. Okay? In fact, this is a good time to, if you look at the problem, if somebody told you where the entries were non-zero, then it's a very simple task. You just throw away all the columns that don't matter, and you solve a simple problem. Okay. So finding the location of the non-zero entries is the difficult part of this. Finding the coefficients is much simpler. Okay. And you can imagine the, the multipath taking place in, in actually bursts. This goes back to the block spots. In fact, if you are familiar with CDMA, they will talk about these uh, fat fingers and thin fingers. Okay. It depends on how specular your scatterer is. If you have a, spe a specular scatterer, you're likely to get a very sharp uh, bounce. If you have a diffuse scatterer, you're likely to get a, a much wider bounce. So it depends on the kind of scatterers you have. So at Qualcomm, they used to tell me all the fat fingers and, and you know, these thin fingers. So now I know what fat fingers are. Okay? So that's block spot as for I'm concerned. Okay? So. And, okay. so let me talk a little about compressive sense. Okay? 
And I think people use this in, now in many papers, okay? Uh, but sometimes they may be uh, overused, okay? So I would like to probably draw a distinction between compressed sensing and the sparse signal recovery problem, okay? And maybe where the, one may want to use uh, different terminology, okay? And the example I'll use is the example typically used in this, in the, to motivate this, okay? The idea is you have an image B that you would like to transmit, okay? And you would like to compress this before transmission, okay? And you apply your magical transform psi. You can pick a DCT if you wish, a wavelet transform, and then hopefully in the transform domain, X is sparse, okay? And then you would transmit X, okay? The question then was asked is why bother to collect B if it already lies in some low dimensional space? Because X is a small number of coefficients. Can we do this without actually collecting B in the first place? And that's really the, the, the key idea here, okay? So instead of collecting B, you collect A times B, which is Y. Okay? And A is your choosing, okay? You choose A, okay? Given Y, so now you transmit Y to the receiver, and the receiver tries to reconstruct B from Y, okay? Now, you know A was decided, was picked, hand-picked. Psi is a transform you plan to use. So if you multiply A times psi, you have P. So now if you look at phi x equal to y, you have this underdetermined system of equations, okay? And x is sparse, okay? So given y, at the receiver, you can then try to undo x based on the sparse recovery techniques, okay? You can apply your favorite sparse recovery techniques, okay? So that's why you solve for phi x equal to y, okay? Once you have x, b is easy because it's just psi x, okay? So you can recover the image now by multiplying x with psi. So here is a case where with just Y, which are linear transformations on B, you're able to recover the original image, okay? Yeah. So as long as your sparsified matrix or transform matrix psi is, uh, or is the normal, then uh, any errors that you make in the reconstruction procedure for, uh, for X uh, will really feed into the same error uh, in the reconstruction procedure for B. But what happens if your sparse time transform is not orthonormal? Yeah, okay. So I, I'm not going to, I think there are, there are some weaknesses. If it is not, hopefully one day you will find one. So the good news about this is you don't need to decide psi a priori. Okay. So because y is available to you, okay, so any day you change your mind about the right psi, you can go back and recompute because okay. you have a times psi and psi. Okay. So the answer to the question is really this is, you would not, you would have a harder time because now you have, you don't have the right transform or you have, if you don't have the right transform, you cannot do this, okay? So this certainly would apply if you know the domain in which X is sparse, okay? So that would be an important component of this, okay? Now, let me say this is quite radical. If you think about, if you've been in compression area, this is quite, uh, quite unique, okay? In compression, whether it be speech compression, video compression, the encoder is very complex. The decoder is very simple. Okay. It's almost, there's a very a great deal of asymmetry. Okay. So if you think about your speech coder, the encoder does all the work. The receiver is very simple. Okay. Video coding is the same thing. Okay. Encoding is difficult. Decoding is extremely simple. This is just the opposite. Okay. This is very, it makes the encoding extremely simple. Okay. It just says, take A times B, send Y. Don't bother to do anything else. Okay. Let all the, the receiver do all the hard work, okay? So you have phi x, the receiver has to do the sparse recovery problem and then reconstruct the image. And the hard work is in this recovery problem, okay? So in some sense, you can think about this, if you have two devices that are communicating and one is more powerful than the other, you want to use this asymmetry, okay? You want to use the asymmetry this way, going this way, as well as this way, okay? So in that sense, this is quite, uh, quite a, a breakthrough in terms of uh, compression per se, okay? You make compression encoding simple, decoding extremely uh, difficult, okay? So here you have two tasks. One is you, of course, need a technique for sparse recovery, okay? And the other one is you need to design the sampling matrix A. So this A matrix is something you need to design, okay? For the examples that I gave you, like the imaging, uh, the MEG, there is no A. You don't get to choose A, okay? You, you are forced by the real estate, and so there is no A to be, to be chosen. In that case, I would not call it compressed sensing. Okay? It's just a sparse signal recovery problem, and I need to solve this. So unless you're 
my feeling is there is no way that you choose and inter introduce in the problem. Maybe uh, one can refrain from using compressive sensing as you just stuck with the problem. Okay. All right. By the way, feel free to ask questions. I think uh, there is no reason to wait till the end. Okay. And I, if I don't finish, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me. Okay. <laughs> the reason being, my goal is to get you thinking about going and looking at future, because whatever I tell you is not going to be enough anyway. So you, if you really, I, I would like to make sure you are excited about going looking at the references and following through. So if I'm able to do that, I'm, I've done my, my purpose is served. Okay. So please ask questions. And uh, as a professor, I can tell you it's easier to work with feedback than without feedback. <laughs> All right. So why do we need to, uh, what is the challenge with this? If you need to find the optimum solution, it's known to be empty, empty high. It's a combinatorial search. You have m possible locations for these k non-zero entries. So n choose k is the number of, of searches you need to do in the worst case to be able to solve this problem. Okay? And this grows very quickly. You can put in a very small number. It's shocking how quickly this, this grows. Okay? And so clearly an optimal search is not, is not in the cards. Okay? The question is, what are the options? This is good news in some sense because whenever the problem is hard, it leaves room for being creative. Okay? So let's see what we can do with this. So there's, I, for the purposes of this talk, I just divided my technique into three classes, and my focus will be here. Okay. A greedy search technique, this is where you search for entries sequentially. So think about, if I told you there was only one non-zero entry, what would you do? You just simply search for the location sequentially. Okay. If you have more than one, then you first find one, you subtract its contribution, and then you go after the second one. Okay. So, and then you can think of variations of that. Okay. There's a very simple very simple and quite, uh, quite uh, useful. Okay. The other ones are based on optimization techniques. Okay. If you want to apply some kind of gradient descent or any kind of optimization technique, you want cost functions that have reasonable smoothness properties, but the indicator function is not continuous. Okay. So as soon as you go from 0 to epsilon, you change the value from 0 to 1. Okay. So people look after alternate cost functions okay, and then use them as a basis for solving for a and hopefully this alternate problem that you solve is actually solving the original problem. And very popular in this case is the L1 minimization, where you minimize the L1 norm of the solution subject to the system of equations. Okay. I'll say a few words about this, but here the, the interesting part is coming up with these cost functions. What are the alternate ones you'll come? And you may want to think about what would you do if I generalize the problem, like the block sparsity or the multiple measurement vectors. How are you going to put structure into this and create this cost function. Ultimately, it would be nice if, if there were simple techniques available that, you know, you do not have to every time spend a lot of time trying to be very creative. <laughs> so you, you reduce that element of it. And the last one are the Bayesian techniques. Right? And here you make some statistical assumptions of the solution. So you say the solution vector x, you put a prior on x. In this case, we know it's sparse. So we say, what prior should we put? And then you use that prior as a way of breaking this ambiguity. Okay? So you hopefully, if you pick the right prior, you can get to the right place. Okay? Now, of course, always, you know, you, the challenge in all this problem is you know what you want to solve, and you know what you can solve, and then finding the right meeting ground. Okay? You never can get the perfect one, but hopefully you will find a right combination. So that's what I'll spend my time on. So there are two uh, techniques that I will, I will spend my, uh, this lecture on. One is the, the map formulation. And this probably most people are familiar with. Take a class in estimation theory, probably the map method is covered. Okay? So I will talk about the map methods. Simply to show you that you can do more than the L1, particularly if you're already using the L1. Okay? So if you're already using the L1, I would like to argue that you can do more than the L1 and I would like to suggest some recipes for doing this. Okay? And then I want you to talk whatever time is left on this hierarchical framework. In a talk like this, I realize sometimes you run out of time. Okay? So I'll do it in two passes. Okay? So the first pass is simply a higher level description of what is the distinction between them. Okay? And why would you do one over the other? That would be my first. Uh, it will be very high level. You just have to be a matter of faith. Okay? That this can be done. Okay? And then I will dig into the details. So let's look at the, the map function. 
Here, your measurements are y, and x is what you see. Okay? And in a map formulation, you look at the posterior distribution, and you find the mode of the posterior distribution. So you max find the x, but maximize the posterior distribution. And then when you apply Bayes' rule, you end up with this conditional density and the prior on x, p of x. P of y given x for our linear model is controlled by the noise. Okay, so you, once you have information on the noise, that is fixed. So if I assume Gaussian noise, then P of y given x is, is not. The only creative part is x, P of x. Okay, this is where you can beg to differ by others. The better prior is this or that. So we can argue over priors and, and see what priors you want to use. So P of x is what you would like to, to play around with in this technique. And if you use a Laplacian prior, like I here, then you will get an L1 penalty. Okay? And this will fall into the, the typical L1 penalty based function of the Lasso framework. Okay? So if you want to stick to the Lasso framework but still want to use the Bayesian statement, then you can say I'm using a Laplacian prior. Okay? What is the hierarchical Bayesian framework? Here we will introduce a new set of hidden variables, gamma 1 through gamma, okay? which will control these axes. Okay, so we use a, one more layer of, of okay. and then we will actually treat the x's as nuisance parameter for time being and integrate x out and we will actually go for a map estimate of gamma given y. Okay. So you introduce this hierarchical framework and you actually now apply a, a map estimate on gamma. So once it comes to the map estimate, the techniques you can borrow. Okay, so the techniques will be similar, not quite, but good enough for practical purposes, for this purpose of talk. What do I tell you for map? You can say there may be variations on this. Yes. When you say that gamma is X, yeah. That means there's a way in which you find a representation for X in terms of these variables. And I'll talk a little more about it in a, in a minute. That's why I said this. I will say a few more words, and we'll go into the detail next as I go next. Okay? Your, your goal from now on yeah. is to somehow yeah. estimate gamma yeah. and then have then, some knowledge of then how then X it. comes out. Yeah, so I will look for a map estimate of gamma. Okay. Mm -hmm. And once I have gamma, I will estimate the posterior distribution of x given y with fixing gamma. gamma. Okay. There are many ways to get the posterior distribution. We have to approximate, and this is the approximation I'll employ. And when I talk about it, I'll say why this is a useful thing to do. So we'll actually get the posterior distribution, and from the posterior distribution, you can actually get all the information you want. Okay? So uncertainty information, if you wish. Of course, this is easier said than done. At this point, there is nothing to believe here that you can actually do it. Okay? <laughs> so, but this is the idea. What is the benefit? So let me, to keep you awake till the end, let me give you the benefits, okay? One, it turns out the map problem is easy to state, but the optimization problem is difficult. There are many local minima, okay? We'll find out when we go there and we put a prior, we'll be faced with a problem that there'll be many local minima and we'll be stuck, okay? So it turns out when you average over X and you look at the posterior distribution of gamma given Y, it has fewer local minima, okay? So you have... Lose, you made the landscape less treacherous for optimization. Right? And the intuitive way of thinking about this, by going further away from the data, you blur the scene a little. Okay? But this blurring for, for this purposes is good for you because some detail is hidden and it's the detail that you don't want. Okay? It's the peaks that you're capturing. You don't want all the fine, rugged details. So you, the smoothing turns out to be very useful. Okay? So you can actually show, if you do it correctly, that you have a better landscape. It's not completely, all the treachery is not gone, but it is less, okay? And the second one is what is used for hierarchical modeling. You know, whenever people talk about hierarchical base, this is the standard uh, motivation for hierarchical base. That you can actually tie several parameters together so that you have fewer parameters to work with, okay? So let's, let me try to explain this, even though I will not go into detail. If you have a block that is non-zero, you can actually have one gamma for the whole block. That way, instead of estimating all the parameters, you're estimating only one parameter for the block. So you've gone to a lower dimensional space. Okay? If you think in terms of rows, when I talk about row sparsity, okay, for each row, you can have a gamma. Okay? So even though the number of measurements increases and the number of x's increase, but the gammas do not increase because each gamma is tied to a row. Towards the end, I will cheat a little and I'll show you one example because I will never get time to really explain how to do this to, so that you'll realize the power of this dimensionality reduction is quite, quite useful. Okay. So these are the two things. So whenever you have structure behind the axis, then the gammas can help. 
And by blurring this function, you tend to minimize the local minima. Okay? So you have a, a better chance of getting to this. Okay? In fact, you will actually, there is an interesting paper called Bayesian Lasso, okay? which applies even for the L1, uses this hierarchical framework. Okay? And they use this to find the penalty, you know, how to weigh the penalty function, the lambda parameter in this regularization. So here's an example where the Laplacian, it turns out, can be written as a Gaussian scale mixture. Okay? So you can write the Laplacian density in terms of P of X given gamma, where P of X given gamma is Gaussian, and P of gamma is, is an exponential, is a one-sided exponential. Okay? So you can write a Laplacian in this form. That means you can introduce this new set of variables gamma with P gamma having this form, and P of X given gamma being Gaussian. Okay? And the Gaussian scale mixture can be a very useful framework for this. Okay? I present this, if you're using I, if you la L1, you may want to contemplate the Bayesian lasso. Okay? So this will be a baby step. Okay? And I've introduced this terminology because this is trying to give us a glimpse of what is to come. Of what are the to make this framework successful, you have to introduce the hierarchical framework in a clever way so that tractability is enhanced. Okay? And I will show you that this Gaussian scale mixture framework is very powerful. Okay? So it allows for lots of interesting things to be done, which would be difficult if you didn't use the right framework. Okay? All right. So let's go back to the basic map formula. Yes. So how realistic is it that you assume uh, one parameter gamma for the uh, one block? I say depends on the application, okay? But if I told you that a row was on and the variance, so what you want to know is you have usually will say either the row is on or off, so you would probably have one parameter for that. And you may want to know in the beginning if the row is on or off. You may not need to know anything else, okay? So in that case, on off is a single parameter for the whole row. Okay. Right. So here's, as I said before, the Creativity is really in P of X, how you choose P of X. Okay? And there are many options to promote sparsity. Okay? So I will talk about, so you choose by choosing this prior. Okay? And this gives room for you to be figuring out, or maybe you can learn this prior. If, if it's an application and you have data somehow, you may be able to learn this prior from the data. So this is a, leaves room for learning also. Okay? And I think I would like to suggest there are growing options for this underlying optimization problem. So let's look at this a little more carefully. So the question is, what prior should I use? Okay. If, if I, we didn't worry about optimization and I ask you, give me a prior, probably there is a prior many people will come up with. Okay. But I will say, I will try to give you an alternate way of coming with a prior. Yes? So I just want to make sure that following this right? Yeah. So the way you're doing this is in the gamma case. So yeah. you want to first estimate gamma and yeah. then estimate x? Okay. Yeah. So now maybe you'll get to it in the future. Yeah. So can you show that if you do it right, if you actually get the right optimum yeah. for gamma, yeah. and then get the right optimum for max from gamma, yeah. then it will be the actual optimum in the original problem? Yeah, yeah. so you will have a retailer type of stuff. Okay. But the answer is yes. Right. So we will actually introduce sparsity through gamma. And we'll argue gamma sparse is the same as x sparse. And then we will we'll establish the equivalence. And you can show the two optimum points. In the noise free case, yeah. But, the, but I will warn you on that, okay? This is like this. You say, yeah, the true optimum, but how do you get to the true optimum? That is the problem, okay? So it's like we know the problem we want to solve, but we don't know how to get there, okay? Yes, yes, okay. He's already on to my last slide, okay? <laughs> All the things I wanted to say are my actually last but one slide, probably, okay? Okay, so, uh, so here's the, uh, the map formulation. So we will assume that the x-rays are independent for this discussion, okay? And so we can what we we'll call a separable prior, and so gxi, lambda gxi is log of pxi, okay? So choosing the prior is like choosing g. This is a one-to-one -one mapping, okay? And this is where map becomes like choosing the cost function, penalty function. How do you want to penalize the, the model mismatch, and how do you sell it? So one can say, you don't need really a map formulation. I can, I can just choose g properly. Very true, okay? So in this case, you can be creative in many ways. You can choose your G, or you can start with a Bayesian framework and ask what kind of distributions really are useful and help ask the statisticians to help you out. Okay? They spent many years doing this, or so maybe they can bail you out, okay, rather than you trying to figure out what G I should use. Okay? 
So it turns out there's a nice result here, which tells you what G's would be used for. And here G is symmetric about the origin. Okay? So if G is non-decreasing and strictly concave function on the positive orbit, okay, then you can show that the local minima of this optimization problem will have no more than n non-zero entries. n is the number of measurements. Okay? Capital M was the number and the size of x. Okay? What we're saying here is if you minimize this function with g of x being concave with the positive octant, okay, then all the, the local minima will at least be have no more than n non-zero entries. Okay? This is not saying you will get the fastest solution, okay? but this is simply saying you will at least be in what are called some of these extreme points on the set. Okay. The reason why it's a worrying result, if you're in a Bayesian framework, then you're probably interested in uh, calculating the conditional expectation, which would give you the minimum mean square error. And uh, the minimum mean square error, which would really be uh, integrating or summing over all the combinatorial possible support sets, uh, would really mean that your answer is non-sparse. So if your algorithm gives you a sparse answer, it implies that you're not achieving the answer. So the answer is, well, you know, I think, uh, first let me just say, this was what was known about L1, and which is why L1 was used. If you go back before the results of, of Candace and, and Donahoe, and you ask why were you using L1, this was a guarantee that it was available. Okay? So this was what motivated people say L1 is a good panel to be used, because based on linear programming considerations, you can actually show that the, this optimum solution must be at one of these points, the extreme points. Okay? Now, it also, when you calculate, so maybe to answer your question. So I, I would say, yes, I, I share that kind of uh, apprehension, okay? But it also depends on when you weight them, or what is the weight that comes at this local minima. If not, because these are local minima after all. So if the local minima is sufficiently small, but there are quite a few of them, so they can still be very, very treacherous for you, okay? Which is why I think the map formulation has some difficulties, and there are ways in which people try to find this, uh, the uncertainty by building a Gaussian around each of these local minima, okay? And that would be problematic, okay? So the answer to the question is yes. So you could get stuck in any of these local, or if you're doing inferencing like we were talking about, it could be a problem, okay? Okay. So let's look at how, what are the possible g-axes, okay? The popular one, which you, which many people probably, in the, before all this, was to use the two-norm minima. And this is clearly a no-no from a sparsity point of view, okay? Because this is not a concave function, and so you would not get any sparse results, okay? In fact, the reason I mention this is because this is very common, okay? Uh, people will take even, like, if lambda goes towards zero, then you just do the pseudo-inverse, okay? And this is something that whenever you see a system equation, we take the pseudo-inverse and we find a minimum two-norm solution, okay? And that would be completely contrary to sparsity. It will be very diffused, okay? So you will get lots of small entries contributing to the solution. Okay? In fact, if you apply this to the, the MEG problem, the whole brain is lit up every time. Okay? And so no matter what the stimulus is, you have activity in the whole brain. Okay? So step away from that, you go to the L1. Okay? The L1 is a very nice sweet spot. And I think you know, this is something which, in the sense that if you look at the positive quadrant, it's, a, it's just a, a line. It's neither concave, it can be convex or concave, it doesn't matter, it's a lie. Okay, so you, it's just, you can call it convex for optimization problem process, concave if you want to look at these extreme points. So it's right a line, it's, you know, it's both. So it has very nice, uh, and also you have the benefit of all the machinery, okay? People who have applied convex optimization. So you can go download a package from Stanford probably and we do it in, in two hours, be running this program, okay? And so in some sense, there's a lot of machinery behind it to help you out. The other examples that people have tried is the super Gaussian distribution, where you look at P, where P is less than equal to 1, okay? And one can argue, this is, say, an example where the blue curve is P equal to 0.5, okay? You can see it has a bigger peak at the origin, but a heavier tail, okay? In fact, if you go towards zero, you can argue that you're actually starting to count, okay? So you, you would like to go towards zero, okay? And here are some penalties that have, are very popular. Uh, one is the one log xi squared plus epsilon by, by Chatron and Yin, okay? A log of mod xi plus epsilon by Candice Boyden group. And we've been looking at x to the p for p less than 1, okay? 
this is by no means exhaustive. Okay? I just want to motivate that there's a whole slew you can do by picking the right G. Okay? So depending on your application, you may want to change it. But if you have no other, if you're looking at the literature for help, there is there, there's help. Okay? So which one should you choose? And what is the dilemma here? Okay? And I think it was alluded to. So I'm going to use this as an example. Okay? If the prior is too sparse, P going to zero, okay, then you get likely to get stuck in a local minimum. Okay? And you may be solving the right problem in the sense that the global minimum may be at the sparsest point, but you will not get there by virtue of the local minimum. And so I'll call that as convergence error. Okay? That means you are solving the right problem, but you are not able to get to the global minimum. You are stuck at, the, at this uh, local minimum. If the prior is not sparse enough, okay, you may actually solve the global, you may get to the global minimum, but it may not be the sparsest. Okay? I mean, you solve the wrong problem. Okay? It's not the same. The two are not the same. Okay? So I'll say that's a structure error. Okay? So when you look at a objective function, you can ask these questions. What is the balance between these two? You know, you, do, I, do I have structural problems? I think that was the question that was asked. I want to make sure my global minimum is at the sparsest. Okay? That may be a rigid stipulation. Okay? Then you may have to live with the, all the other consequences that come with it. But it turns out lately a lot of interesting algorithms have come up. So I want to say you should not be, uh, even though I think it makes me nervous and it should make you nervous, all these local minima. Okay. But I think in applications, you have a good, if you start with a decent starting point, hopefully you are in the right basin of attraction. Okay. So for many applications, there may be other uh, tools that you have. You have been already, maybe you've been solving this problem for years. Okay. So you have a good uh, recipe, you just not ha it's not completely satisfactory. So you can use that as an initial condition. So I would say, you know, this has always been the case for nonlinear optimization. Properly initialized, okay? But just if you do it right, hopefully this will still be useful, okay? So how do we minimize this, okay? So I would say there are quite a nice interesting algorithms. And in this class, I will talk about the reweighted L2 and the reweighted L1, okay? So these are very nice algorithms for you to employ in case you want to go, you're not happy with the L1, let's say you're trying the L1, and you say, give me, tell me what, what is the next step I should take, I say, do the reweighted L1 or reweighted L2. The reason being, is one more loop on top of your L1. So, so programming-wise, pretty simple, and I will try to convince you of that. And the idea is very simple. Okay? They are based on this majorized minimization algorithm. Okay? That is, if you look at this optimization problem, the reason it is difficult, is this is the easy part. Okay? It's this concave part here. So what we want to do is bound this function with a very simple function and minimize the bound. Okay. And that's what we'll do. And if you can find a good bound for this, then hopefully the optimization problem is easy. Okay. And the proof of these major minimization is the pictures are, are worth are more than the proof. It's as simple as that. This is the, let's say I'm trying to function, minimize g of theta. Okay. And my guess, current guess is theta at minus 1. I want to find the next guess. We draw a, a, a smooth function f of theta that Upper bounds is this g, okay, and then you minimize f of theta. Okay. And that theta n will also be minimizing g of theta. Okay. So you have a really, so the question is really you find good bounds. Okay. And if you take a class in convex optimization, you must be already thinking, oh, this is easy. For a concave function, you know, this, the supporting hyperplanes are a very simple way of getting this. Okay. So for a scalar function, it's just a straight line, okay, because on the right side. So let me show you. Here's my, my scalar function. It's concave on the positive quadrant, okay? and by symmetry, it, it's this. Okay? So I only need to upper bound on the positive quadrant, and by symmetry, I will upper bound the other one. Okay? So we draw a line, and we know this line will upper bound, and then by symmetry, I extend it. Okay? What does it take to find the line? It just takes the derivative, and I need to know the derivative at that point. Okay? So for those functions, it's pretty straightforward. Okay? And there is my recipe. Okay? You upper bound by a line. And these weights are just the slope of that line, okay? And then you minimize this weighted L1, okay? You repeat this till convergence, okay? So you have a sequence of reweighted L1 techniques that you can apply. It's a simple, a simple idea. Okay? Of course, this is not our technique. Okay? This is a work by, by Candace Boyd and group, okay? They were suggested for this particular penalty function, okay? But this can apply to other functions. So if you have a concave function, which is mod of x1, you can apply this bounding technique. Okay? And here's the weight that you need to apply at each step. It's a closed form answer. In fact, it's very easy to write a program that does reweight L1. Okay? 
But I must caution you. The fact that it is L1 sometimes makes people very, you know, lulls them, thinking, oh, I, I have an easy problem. Reweighted L1 is not the same as L1. Okay? All the guarantees you had for L1 don't hold here. Okay? Because you're still minimizing this concave objective function, and the L1 is just an intermediate step. So the local minima problem does not go away just because you're using an L1 framework. Okay? If you're not happy with L1 and you want L2, you know, people, uh, to me, L1 is, a, is, for now at least, this is as good as close form. It's just a simple, uh, well-known optimization problem. But if you want something more uh, close form, then you can use reweighted L2. Okay? And I will say a few words on this. Suppose I can write g of xi as h of xi squared. So if I was able to select that, and h is concave okay? on the positive argument, then I upper bound h. Okay? So I upper bound h, and then I replace the variable with x squared. Okay? So I will get a quadratic upper bound for g of x, and it's a very simple optimization problem. So here's the idea. You have a quadratic upper bound on G, this one we can write in closed form. Okay, and we can write the answer in closed form. Okay, and selecting the weights is just taking the gradient of, of H. Okay, so you can actually do a reweighted L2 if you want. Okay, your choice. Okay, I'm old fashioned, so maybe L2 appeals to me. I, I like this closed form. But for most people these days who are into optimization, L1 is as good as closed form. Okay, so you just run the L1 program. So here's an example. Okay? So if I apply g of xi is mod xi to the p, I can think of this as xi squared to the p by 2. So this is the h, remember h of x squared. Okay? So I can think of this function as xi squared to the p by 2. Okay? And then I can bound this h, and then I can, up, this is my weight. Okay? So I can come up with these weights very easily. So, what I, what, so the first thing I want to point out is you select g, if you have this concave, you have a minimal guarantee I, have, I gave you, okay? And then finding these reweighted L1 and L2 are quite simple, okay? Same thing is true for the short run and yen case, okay? Where you can find a, a reweighted L2 framework for this, okay? Okay, so let me show you some toy examples, just to convince you that at least these work on toy examples, and I believe there's a, a growing body of people who, who have run them on experiments and find them reasonable to work with, okay? Here, we choose, we create data artificially so that we know the answer and we can check. That's really what it is. So we generate a matrix C with 50 by 250 entries. Okay, 50 measurements, 250 unknowns. That's what it is. We then randomly select a, a subset of non-zero entries, okay? And the non-zero entries are chosen to come from a Gaussian distribution. So we, we create the X that we want, okay? And then we generate the Y by f Y equal to phi X. So we know the answer. We know everything here. Okay. So we know y, we know phi, we know xl. Okay. And then we present y and phi to the algorithm and say, what is x? Okay. So we can compare. Okay. And we use a very strict comparison. You have to find the correct answer because there's no noise. Okay. So either you get it or you don't get it. So that's the criteria. You can argue that maybe it's too harsh. It uniformly we use that idea. Okay. And we repeat it a thousand times okay. so that we can come up with a probability better. How many times did you succeed and how many times did you fail? So here's the graph that documents that. This x-axis is the number of non-zero entries. So that means 2, 4, up to 22. Okay. 50 is the number of measurements. Okay. So we, the number of non-zero entries in this case is slightly less than half in this case. And this is the probability of success. 1 means you're successful all the time. Okay. And 0 means you fail miserably. Okay. So you can see as the number of non-zero entries increases, this is the L1. Okay. Okay. You want your curves to be one, if you can, all the way. Okay. That would be what you would like. Okay. So here's your L1 on the data. Okay. Here's your reweighted L1, the red, red curve. Okay. And then the, the other curve is the reweighted L2. Okay. And this consistency, by the way, I, I encourage you to try it, and you will, without fail, produce a very similar looking graph. Okay. Because I did this, uh, last, when I taught this class, I had a class of 10 students, and I asked them all to produce, you know, run computer simulations, and pretty much, I don't know if they consulted each other, but still, the <laughs> plots look the same. Okay. So it's, but nevertheless, I think this is very, very predictable in terms of its performance. Okay. So 
So my suggestion is, you know, if you're running the L1 and you're happy with the L1, or you're unhappy with the L1, you can try the same program with some modification can be used for rebid it with L1 and L2. Okay. Okay. I have a question. Sure. Is, is there also a phase transition if you have too many non-zero coefficients? Is that, what, is that in part what you're saying? You're actually yeah. following that with the reweighted yeah, I think um, so. L1 and 2. Um, so uh, the answer to the question is possible if you ran this for different combinations of N and M and uh, K, that there would be a, you could actually draw this phase transition. Okay, yeah. But now, why this works better than this in this plot, I cannot tell you. Okay, that much knowledge we do not. Okay, so it just says that this objective function that you're minimizing is a better, has a global minimum consistent with this partial solution. Okay, and failure may be because of the local minimum. Okay, so now I'm ready to move on to, the, to the, the second part, which is the hierarchical Bayesian techniques, okay? So here, one of the problems is the number of local minima, okay? And sometimes you may have as many as order m choose n, okay? So you can actually look at all these and say all of them are local minima. There's not much you can do, okay? okay. So for this, I want to go to do some blurring and get maybe a slightly different framework, okay? So here, we were interested only in the mode of the posterior, but most often we want to know more, so we maybe want to know the posterior distribution per se. Okay, in many cases, people say, and this is not uncommon, and this is very standard. Actually, you want the posterior distribution. You want p of x given y, if I can give it here. Okay? But it's wanting one and getting one is not the same. Okay? And this has been a, a, a problem forever, and there are many approximations used to come up with some kind of a posterior distribution. Okay? And I will suggest one based on this hierarchical framework. So the idea here is, as I said, we'll introduce a new set of variables, okay? And then we'll solve for gamma using a math estimate. Okay, so all the tools I talked about hopefully can be applied. Okay. And then we'll calculate the posterior by using P of X given Y, if gamma fixed or gamma hat, okay? And this idea was actually suggested by Chipping in his, in his work, original work, okay? So uh, that's what got us motivated. When I first saw the work, I thought, would not work, okay, then again, of course, you run simulation and it always seems to work, and then you sit for five years. And this is my student, David Griff, okay. He was working on the, the map estimates, and then he stumbled upon this, he stopped working on that. And I had already invested 10 years, so I was not ready to give up. <laughs> I said, look, you know, we have invested so much time, but he kept finding these plots. And so we had, I said, okay, well, but you can spend the next five years explaining why, okay. So we have partial answers, and I will explain what we, what we know. Okay. There is a paper, by the way, in the IT transaction that talks about this, this problem. So if you're interested in the details, there's a, a paper in the information theory transactions about a year ago, I think. So the main idea here is in this framework to be useful, we need tractable representations. Okay. We need to introduce this framework and still be tractable. Otherwise, this will be not be useful. And it turns out this Gaussian scale mixture framework is a very powerful way of doing this, okay? And, you know, Gaussian should always be music to your ears, your Bayesian. Whenever you see Gaussian, lots of things can be done in closed form, and you can do things you couldn't do otherwise, okay? So as long as you can bring in Gaussian, maybe you can actually resolve things more completely, okay? And what does that mean? That means your prior P of Xi, you must be able to write it in this form where P of Xi given gamma i is a, a Gaussian density with mean zero and variance gamma i, okay? And there's a prior on gamma i. That means you have these Gaussian random variables with variance are random and they have a prior P gamma, okay? So, so what you've done is change the problem from saying, give me P Xi to give me P gamma i. You know what? Because if you give me P gamma i, this is not changing because you fix the conditional distribution and you get P Xi. So in that sense, you are now asking what are the right P gamma I should I use so that I get this, this problem, okay? The good news, it turns out, many of the distribution we were looking at have a Gaussian scale mixture representation, okay? So most of the priors that people have used, like the super Gaussian, student T, all of them seem, have this Gaussian scale mixture this property, okay? So they've already been studied by mathematicians and you'll find papers, okay? So you go there, says maybe I can, there's a whole list of distributions, and you can pick your favorite one, all of them with this Gaussian scale mixture framework, okay? And so, as I said before, it's a matter of changing P gamma, okay? So here's an example of these, some of these examples. 
Laplacian which has been used, and I said this is your P gamma. Okay. So you're choosing P gamma, you change P gamma, you get the Laplacian. Here's the student T, which is, which is quite popular. If you look at the recent papers, a lot of people are using student T to handle these, uh, these kind of uh, variables. Again, the mixing distribution is a gamma distribution. Okay. And this, this is not exhaustive. Super Gaussian, this is more difficult. There's something called a positive alpha stable density to come up and do this. So there are, the good news is this Gaussian scale mixture is a, has a lot of distribution that we already know fit under this form. So why is this useful? Okay. So, you know, just because they have, I, I want to argue that this Gaussian scale mixture is very tractable, which is why you want to do this. This is the problem we're trying to solve. Okay. Imagine I fix gamma. What does that mean? If I fix gamma, then x is Gaussian. Okay. Because x, given gamma, is a Gaussian density with mean zero and variance gamma. Okay. V is Gaussian, okay, by assumption, noise. This is a linear transformation of Gaussian random variables, so y is Gaussian. Okay. Once you fix gamma, you fix gamma, this is a, all of these are Gaussian, and you actually have a very nice tractable form. So you can write everything in closed form, conditioned on gamma. Okay. So if I ask you what is the P of gamma given Y? Let's take an example. Okay. I want to do this posterior modification. Okay. It's P of Y given gamma, P gamma. Okay. Once I give you gamma, that means this X is Gaussian, V is Gaussian, they're independent, Y is Gaussian. So you can actually write this density in closed form. And that's what really this is. Okay. So it turns out this conditioning on gamma and having this Gaussian scale mixture gives rise to a very nice tractable form. Okay. And now you need to spend some time trying to show that gamma is actually sparse. Okay. Because the sparsity will come as a result of, of x will be a consequence of the x's. And I'll show you that in a minute. Okay. It turns out at the end a little disappointing after all the theory, actually. I was very disappointed when I first saw it. But they use a very non-informative prior for P gamma, okay? So, so you know, you tell me all this story and then you pick up a non-informative prior, but then it turns out even this can be explained. And you can look at the, the ultimately you can say, what does non-informative mean? It means you're dropping this term in some sense. Okay? Then you can look at this cost function and say, what are its properties, okay? okay. So uh, this would be a message I would like to also share with you. You can start with the Bayesian framework, but at the end, you look at the optimization problem and ask questions on the optimization problem. If it doesn't give you satisfactory answers, probably you should go back and revisit your Bayesian framework. Okay. The posterior density is what I want to talk about. This is why we use this as a choice of posterior. Once you fix gamma hat, P of X given Y is a Gaussian atom, is a Gaussian density, and you can actually write the mean and, and variance of the posterior density. Okay. And you will notice the gammas play a role here. If the gamma is sparse, the mu will be sparse. So the mean of this posterior density will be sparse if the gamma is sparse. So this is an indirect way at which you get the sparsity through these gammas. Okay. And we, there are many recipes for this. We've used the EM recipe for solving this problem. Okay. So what are the properties? I think I already talked about them. So let me just quickly. First, you can show that local minima are sparse and will have no more than n non-zero entries. So the same kind of guarantees that we had before. Okay. We can show that compared to the P of X given Y, this has far fewer local, has fewer local minima than the original math problem. So this going to the framework has blurred the function a little and you are able to avoid some local minima. Okay. And lastly, in high signal noise ratio, you can actually show that the global minima is a sparse solution. Okay, no structural problem. So if you're able to get to the right answer, you will be fine. But the getting to that is not guaranteed. Okay. So again, the same simulation just to show you what we can get. Okay. Same results as before. This is the sparsity, and this is the probability of success. One is good, and this is the number of non-zero entries. This is Laplacian, re-weighted L1, re-weighted L2, and the green curve is the SBR. Okay. Not much better. Okay but consistently better. Okay, so this is, again, you'll find this when you do numerical ex experiments. And it, there's a consistency about how these techniques do. Okay. But remember, I told you the, the benefit of this is the tying of parameters. I should leave with you with one more numerical result. Okay. Here we solve this multiple measurement vector problem, where we have five measurements. Okay. That means each row has five non-zero entries. Okay. 
So if you solve the problem in the X space, you have five times more parameters than if you solved in the gamma space. So you have a tying of the parameters. Okay? And here are the results. These are all variations for that particular problem. This is the L1 variation. Okay? What you do is you put an L2 penalty on the row, and then you do an L1. Okay? This is the corresponding V-weighted L1, V-weighted L2, and this is your hierarchical frame. The problem here is not that these things are not solving. They're solving the right problem, but they can stuck in local minima. Okay? And by going to this lower dimension, you actually avoid some of these local minima. Okay? And you're able to get to the true, true answer. Okay? So whenever they structure, you'll see more dramatic improvement. Okay? Or if you make the problem more challenging. Okay? All right. So let me end. I hope I convinced some of you at least. That the, if you're working in the L1 and take the Bayesian methods, do offer some interesting options. And already there are enough tools for you to exercise if you want to. Okay? And one of them is you can try the reweighted L2, L1. These are almost for free, I think. Okay? And if, you want, if you're not happy with these also, then I suggest trying the hierarchical framework and see if you have better luck. Okay? My claim, and this is based on working with my students, is that they can be they're more versatile. Okay? In the sense that if you add more structure and I ask you, Give me a variation on this. It turns out there are obvious ways to extend the Bayesian framework, okay? particularly if you want to put structure among the components. Okay? Lastly, though, I would say you know, at the end, it's always better to go back and look at the objective function that you come up with. It doesn't matter how you got there. Okay? You, you can get there. Once you get to the objective function, you look at the objective function and ask, does it have the desirable properties that you, you want? Okay. If it is, then it is probably the right place to start. Okay. okay. I think I'll stop here and take some questions. Okay. Questions? Um, one is, the, how, how well does, do you have an example from the time varying multi dimensional response. Well, time varying means time varying sparsity well, or time yeah, varying? Time varying spark, well. Yeah, the, no, there's the location is on, uh, yeah, this is the result for that part. Well, that's, that's, that's one where you have five measurements and the entries are non-zero. They're at the same. They're at the same location, but not same size. Okay. Okay. And, and any also results for different locations? Or are those just five independent problems and oh, not so if you change the location of the function of time, yeah. Then, well, yeah, then it's a different, then you have to come up with what is the right mathematical model for how the variation is taking place. Yes, this yeah. is the challenge of what we face typically, which is what is stationary and non-stationary. Okay. Okay. So we always divide them into small enough blocks where we can say things haven't changed and then we apply some principles. So that would be the first step. But of course, if you have a model for time variation, then you can put that in. I was wondering, um, yeah. well, also, second question, whether um, you've looked at any sequence matching, uh, warping, mm -hmm. alignment type applications of the sparse spacing learning. Does it? Uh, I'm thinking of Ramsey and Silverman using a random effect to put curves into alignment. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering whether this applies. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know if it's even close, but yeah. I have more of a logistics type of question. So suppose that I know a little bit about Bayesian, and suppose that I know a lot more about optimization. How long would it take me to take this into this and come up with something like that? So is it like a three-year-long commitment, or I can understand most of it in a year? You know, if, if most double E students get a lot of statistical you know, estimation theory classes. So everybody learns EM and so on. So going, so in my mind, is going to the hierarchical framework is not is also commonplace in the machine learning kind of literature. So I think it's not a stretch in that sense. And you know nowadays with these belief propagation algorithms, a lot of new algorithms are coming up, which are lowering the complexity. One of the knocks about these is complexity, but with these message passing algorithms, the complexity is also going down. So at some point, it will always come down to do they work and do they work better and what guarantees you give me. It, probably the complexity will be a, a, not a bigger issue. So, so, just by, uh, great talk. Uh, I, I was going to respond to that question. You have Professor Job, the HOU, here who is one of the experts in majorization, minimization, who worked with Ken Lang. 
Paper, California. What is the last name? Zhou, Z-H-O-U. Which oh, one? Okay. This one. This one. Okay. I think he's in staff, so perhaps. Okay. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, uh, I think we are running out of time, so maybe we can talk offline if you have further questions. So let's thank our speaker.